mysterious glowing ring on the ground. Unexplained impressions found in the earth. Windshield of a deputy sheriff's squad car smashed. I believe that something extraterrestrial really did happen here. Nobody's ever been able to prove that it was something different. Is the evidence of UFO landings, flyovers, and collisions out there? And it's probably the biggest story of mankind if we come out and show the people the evidence. And in a History Channel exclusive, new evidence to a major UFO encounter forces one investigator to reopen a case. It's damage that was caused by a force pushing that windshield in and then back out again. And really? From photographs to soil samples and lab results, UFO files, alien encounters. April 6th, 2001, Mount Clemens, Michigan. It seems like a routine drive down a desolate highway. That is, until one woman's nighttime journey goes from mundane to bizarre. And as she was going down the road, she noticed that there was a bright basketball-sized object heading toward her. It appears to be just above the highway surface. And as they're coming at each other, the closing rate's pretty great. And she can see what looks like a pinwheel configuration, little sort of plumes coming out around her, as though it's rotating rapidly. Although rotating orbs are commonplace in UFO lore, one element of this story puts it into another league entirely. Suddenly, there's an impact on the passenger side of the top of the car, which she could feel and hear quite distinctly. Continues to fly away. And immediately, she pulls over and, obviously scared to death, gets out of the car, and she finds a trail of a sort of yellowish residue on the red paint. This residue is what ufologists classify as trace evidence. Actually, what we're looking at are the fingerprints of UFOs. This is something that they generate as a solid mass. Whether well, it's a burn circle, burn ring, vegetation that doesn't grow anymore, whatever. There's a physical effect. It's not just an observation by the eyeballs. Something you can go to after the saucer is left. In the Michigan case, the trace evidence, the tan residue located on the car, is subjected to a thorough forensic analysis by an analytical chemist who specializes in identifying materials. I found that uh, the tan material is composed of a metal oxide. And I couldn't really specifically identify it. Then there was also a celluloidal material. That's a material related to plants. Probably natural origin. This natural material that Phyllis Buttinger discovers may be a clue to the object's origin. It was almost plant-like in nature, and yet it had other uh, indications that it was mechanical. And uh, the most interesting thing to me was that she determined, because of residue on this material, that this thing probably, very probably, had been submerged in a farm pond or something like that a short time before it impacted the automobile.
Buttinger rules out a small meteor and a foreign object from the road. She further concludes that whatever the object's origin may be, it carried no heat and was of an extremely low mass. It's really a wild guess, but clearly I cannot think of any natural phenomena coming from the sky and leaving the dirt like that and not also causing a lot of damage to the car. So it's truly a mystery. This event is just one of more than 3,000 incidents that have been categorized as trace cases since the 1960s. Despite the ongoing debate between skeptics and believers, trace evidence offers up proof of scientific abnormalities. Abnormalities that have yet to be explained. Today, the UFO community pays tribute to one man for bringing trace cases to the forefront of scientific scrutiny. Northwestern University astronomer and U.S. government UFO consultant, Dr. J. Allen Hynek. So he turned on a lot of people to do something besides just report UFOs. He said, specialize, specialize, specialize. Come up with something that you can do that somebody else can't. And uh, he's the one that actually stimulated the study of trace cases. Alan Hynek and I, as we went through the years, became very, very good friends. And he believed that so many things were going on that they had to be categorized. And because we were throwing a lot of things into one basket, and you're going all the way from a light in the sky to a landing and little guys. Out of these UFO cases, Dr. Hynek and Phillips agree that the most startling evidence came from the trace cases. They believe that this scientific evidence could be the key to solving the UFO riddle. When we could get to a site early on enough to be able to do compression tests on those uh, indentations and determine a fairly accurate uh, uh, weight distribution. And the weights that you would come up with on the uh, egg-shaped objects would be on the order of uh, 14, 15 tons, and the classic disc about 8 to 10 tons. These early observations led Dr. Heineck and Phillips to the belief that they were onto something big. Then, in 1964, an event in Socorro, New Mexico, changed their entire approach to the UFO topic. There was a police officer, Juan Izamora. He was driving his police car. He, he heard a noise, and he thought somebody had blown up a, a dynamite shack or something. Being a cop, he has that curiosity factor. Something happened out of the ordinary. What was that flash? comes up over a little rise. Uh, there, about 75 yards from him, is an object sitting on the ground. He sees this sort of egg-shaped craft sitting on the ground with what seemed to be two child-sized beings next to it, one-piece outfits. And it took off with the roar, which scared the bejeebers out of him, as you can imagine. A subsequent investigation of UFOs by the United States Air Force found physical trace evidence that supported Officer Zamora's testimony. This included a quadrangle formation of landing legs, four impressions in the ground from the craft's ladder, and finally, four footprints from the small beings that were observed by Zamora. The case is still carried as an unknown in the Air Force files. And believe me, they tried everything to put something conventional in there. And, uh... As time passed, Phillips says he came across thousands of cases that supported the reality of the UFO phenomenon. But ultimately, it would be an obscure event in rural Kansas and a single Polaroid photograph that would change everything. 
she took the only photograph I've ever seen of a luminous sight taken within 10 minutes of the ascent of an object. November 2nd, 1971, Delphos, Kansas. 16-year-old Ronnie Johnson begins his chores on a small farm at approximately 6.30 in the evening. What occurs next not only changes Ronnie's life forever, but also influences the researchers of UFO trace cases for more than three decades. As he's working, suddenly he hears a noise sounds, he said, like a large, out-of-balance washing machine. It was very loud, and the area lit up. And there, hovering uh, about five feet above the ground, was an object some eight feet in diameter, the top of which was about ten feet above the ground. It was brilliantly glowing in multi colors. No particular color at any particular time. Ronnie stands in fear as he watches the object. Toward the end of this period, the brightness of the object increased, the sound increased, and the glow at the base of the object increased. The glow at the base of this thing appeared to be like a shimmering steam that was falling from the base toward the ground. And as he watched, it flared up in brightness and it blinded him as it took off. He could hear the sound receding to the south slowly. And finally, he uh, re started regaining his vision, ran to the house, told his parents, they ran outside, also saw the object. After they observed the object in the sky, the Johnsons walk over to where the young boy had said the craft was hovering. The family is astonished by what they see. They saw this big luminescent ring in the ground and luminescence on the trees nearby. Ran to the house and they drug out the old Polaroid camera. And it had one image left. And they went out and she took the only photograph I've ever seen of a luminous sight taken within 10 minutes of the ascent of an object. This is the actual Polaroid photograph taken by Ronnie's mother, Irma Johnson. After photographing the glowing ring, the family quickly realizes that there is much more to discover. Ron's parents both touched the newly deposited substance that was released by this UFO, and immediately their fingers became numb. Mrs. Johnson touched her leg with her hand, and her leg became numb. Frightened by the physical effect on her body, the family continues to survey the property for additional clues to what could possibly have happened. The only round end of this area is around a, a tree, seven inch diameter tree, that was lying on the ground. Uh, the previous afternoon, the tree was upright and fine. Could this tree have been knocked down by the craft Ronnie witnessed? The Johnson family is left clueless. The next day, Sheriff Ralph Inlow launches an investigation on the property. When the sheriff arrived and he went out into the site, he was the first one to notice a broken tree limb, which was broken eight and a half feet above the ground and initially had projected out over the edge of the ring. So he decided, well, probably this is broken back and downward because of an object or a solid something that went in there. 
Sheriff Enlow also discovers a mysterious residue inside the ring. And by that point in time, the ground surface of the ring was a pure, pure white crust, very hard. And as shows up in the photograph, its contrast to the soil in the center and the soil around it is remarkable. Perplexed by his findings, Sheriff Enlow bottles soil samples and locks them in his office safe. Four weeks later, when word reaches Dr. Hynek about the Delphos event, he sends Ted Phillips to investigate. When I arrived at the farm, I talked to the witnesses briefly and they took me out to the side of the ring. Uh, which was a mud bog. And to my amazement, here in this black, wet, sloppy, water-retaining soil was a perfectly outlined ring of snow, unmelted snow, and totally covered just the ring. And it was an amazing thing to see, so I shot a lot of photos of it. The unmelted snow in the ring is a startling piece of evidence in Phillips' investigation. The ring at the landing site is hydrophobic or water repellent. Something has affected the soil. Well, this is very significant because uh, the same thing has happened in a lot of cases where UFOs have landed or nearly landed. They have changed the soil and changed the plant life so nothing grows. Phillips approaches Delphos and other UFO trace cases with the same meticulous and detailed method of a crime scene investigator. In a crime scene investigation, <clears throat> the predominant theory is that you cannot walk into a crime scene and leave without taking something with you and or leaving something behind. And it's up to the investigator or the crime scene tech to find out what that was. Same thing holds true in a UFO incident and when you have trace evidence. So the first thing you do is photograph everything before you disturb any part of the crime scene. And so after I had done all the necessary photography, I started laying out lines and getting measurements to get the exact size of the ring. After I had gone thoroughly over the ring, I started looking over the other area with the family kind of taking me, okay, this happened here, this happened there. Although no sign of a hoax is apparent at the scene, in Delphos, Phillips scrutinizes the Polaroid photograph taken by Mrs. Johnson. I tried many times to reproduce the Polaroid image shot that night. It's just not possible. I've tried everything, and again, using the same camera, the same film, same lighting conditions, with and without flash, and uh, it's, it's just not possible. Intrigued by his findings at the site, Phillips returns to Dr. Hynek with nearly 40 pounds of soil samples and more than 100 photographs. So what was it on the ground? I shook it up, and the water turned red. And I thought, oh my god, there's something here, you know what? I really shook me up for a day or so when I realized that, yes, there is something there. The full-length TV shows, all in one place. The new AOL. See what's here for you. Beginning in the 1960s, Dr. J. Allen Hynek believed that trace cases might be the key to solving the UFO enigma. In 1971, in the small town of Delphos, Kansas, a UFO encounter set the bar for trace case examination. 
hoping to obtain a valid and unbiased scientific opinion on the case. Dr. Hynek enlisted the help of a few brave scientists who concluded that the soil of the Delphos ring was considerably different from the normal ground soil. But the next breakthrough in the Delphos analysis would not come for more than 20 years when Ted Phillips met analytical chemist Phyllis Buttinger. Inside the scientific world, Buttinger's expertise is known as spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is a group of techniques. You can also quantify things in liquids and in gases. And each molecule will react differently with the light and giving absorption bands, and the result is a unique spectrum. Much as DNA is unique to each human. To investigators outside the scientific world, simply put, you give Buttinger a dirt from Delphos, and she will tell you what's in it. So in 1999, Phillips sent samples to Bunninger's Frontier Analysis Laboratory in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, for study. I really didn't know what to expect. I knew there was some organic substance there. I didn't know what I was going to find. I'll never forget when I first got them. I put some in a test tube, put water on top of it, and I shook it up, and the water turned red. And I thought, oh my God, this is, this, there's something here, you know? What <laughs> I really, that, that, uh, that shook me up for a day or so. When I realized that, yes, there is something there. Astonished by her first observations, Buttinger is also surprised that the soil is still hydrophobic yeah! or water repellent, even 30 years after the event. In 2006, she recreates the experiment in her laboratory, and her results are exactly the same. Okay, I'm going to show you that the Delphos ring soil is still hydrophobic after all these years. I'm going to add these approximately the same amount of water. water extract on the top is a much darker color than that of the control sample. So clearly something has been extracted. On subsequent trips to the Delphos site over a period of 10 years, Phillips noted that the ring on the ground remained visible and that no new plant life was able to grow. Although researchers cannot explain why they believe the craft made the soil hydrophobic, Buttinger offers a scientific reason for how. There was an organic material coated on the surface of the soil that made it hydrophobic. And this organic material was identified by myself as fulvic acid. Fulvic acid is a naturally occurring substance found in the ground during plant decomposition. It can cause soil rejuvenation and can be an excellent supplement to fertilizer. Although fulvic acid is found naturally in soil, Buttinger believes the amount of it in the Delphos ring is anything but natural. Fulvic acid would not be in the concentrations that is naturally occurring. It was added, it was a, it's part of a release of something. There is no natural explanation for these high levels of fulvic acid in the soil. I really don't know where it came from. This unexplained release of fulvic acid is not the only abnormality that Buttinger discovered in the Delphos soil sample. High levels of oxalic acid, which is a known skin and eye irritant, were also found to be present in the soil. Oxalic acid could account for the numbing effects on Mrs. Johnson's fingers and leg that lasted for the remainder of her life. But for scientists, this compound, coupled with the fulvic acid, 
makes way for some interesting speculation on the glowing effects of the soil. I think that the substance came when it was being released from the craft is that the craft's propulsion system created an ionic field which excited the material. And I think when it fell, it was luminescing from the interaction with the ionic field of the craft. And I think it's a clue to the propulsion system of this machine. Buttinger's theory and analysis have motivated investigators and researchers to come up with some type of scientific explanation. Three years after the Delphos incident, another trace evidence case causes widespread panic in Missouri. All the people are screaming, and it's hovering there 10 feet above the ground. left behind. From a quadrangle formation of landing legs in Socorro, New Mexico, to a mysterious glowing ring in Delphos, Kansas, since 1964, there have been thousands of cases of UFO trace evidence. To field investigator Ted Phillips, these common trace characteristics he has discovered support the reality of UFOs. And in the hundreds of cases I've personally investigated, uh, my conclusion is that we're dealing with a device, a machine of mass. Constructed by an intelligence and under the control of something intelligent and that's obvious by the things that they do the way they maneuver into a landing site out of it a number of things September 1st 1974 Langenberg Saskatchewan Canada for farmer Edwin Furr a routine chore turns into one of the most frightening experiences of his life. Fur observed this object near the ground. He stopped and went over very close to it. And he could see it was metallic looking. It was flat on the bottom. It was domed on top. It was hovering uh, just a foot or so over the ground. And he's 15 feet in daylight away from an object no sound it's spinning rotating at a very high rate in the surface of this thing he said it had a very old and used up appearance and in it he could see dark sort of grooves at the base he could see a sort of wide belt that went around the lower section. Shocked at what he encounters, Fur slowly retreats back to his tractor, hoping to escape from the object. As he climbs back on, his shock turns to terror when he realizes there is more than just one UFO. And he could see there were four more. And they were sort of equidistant from each other in a semicircle around the high grass. All same type of objects, same configuration, same color, all rotating. The ground or the crop underneath the object was spun in a spiral. And the plants were rotated and knocked down underneath each one of these. After hovering in the field for a few minutes, the objects begin their ascent. The objects ascended silently, vertically, in a step formation. Object one, two, three, four, five. And as they ascended vertically, silently, he could see beneath each object two 
vent-like extensions, out of which there came a six-foot-long plume of gray material. Shortly after, the objects disappear. After first encounter, Constable Ronald Morier of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police receives word of the event and visits the fur property. The physical trace evidence that he discovers puzzles the investigators. Here were five rings, all swirled, compressed in the same direction, all counterclockwise. And the central area in each of the rings was unaffected. The grass was standing up normally. And their sizes ranged from eight foot in diameter to 11 feet in diameter. And Morier's conclusion after a full and extensive investigation impressed me considerably. He said, this really happened, and whatever made these rings came out of the air and left the same way. And that pretty well says it. More than three decades have passed since the event, and multiple field investigations have not produced a single logical explanation. Throughout the 1970s alone, Phillips catalogs more than 400 events similar to the Langenberg case. October 8, 1978. Cato, Missouri. A grandmother and her grandchild witness a mysterious object in the field that catches their attention. She could see an oval white something sitting in the field. And I found later that this was about 185 feet from the house. And so she called her husband. He called his son. And it wasn't doing anything. It was just sitting there. The neat part is they came up with the explanation that it must be a piece of metal that blew in there in a storm. So they didn't say it's a UFO out there. They said, you know, something's in our field and it shouldn't be there. We got to get it out. When the father starts his tractor to move the object, something strange occurs. The object leaps about 10 feet straight up into the air. Reaction. Control. And this thing is only like four feet in diameter. And all the people are screaming. And it's hovering there, 10 feet above the ground. The object then begins an ascent away from the property. Not fast, just kind of cruising. No sound at any time. And the object is rotating. No wings, no engine, no visible means of support. It continues its climb. It makes a definite right turn, which I find later is across the wind. Flies to the right slightly for a few feet, makes a very strong left turn across the wind, another right turn, and continues to climb. As the object increases elevation, the witnesses report that it merges with a second, much larger cylindrical-shaped UFO in the sky. And the cylinder flies away at a pretty good rate of speed. And so the farmer and his son walked to the spot where the object had been. And they arrived there to find a four-foot area of dehydrated plants. And the whole site already has turned a very dead, wilted brown. The physical characteristics left behind by the UFO and Cato makes it a classic trace case. This photograph, taken only a few minutes after the event, proves to Phillips that something unexplained took place on the farm in Cato, and he wants to find out what it was. 
The site basically is oval. The grass immediately surrounding it is lush green, perfectly healthy. Not another spot in the entire field that looks like this area. And at the outside edge of the site, near these two little impacted craters, bull nettle plants, which are large leafed, very tough plants. The leaves were not burned, but they were drawn up tightly as though some kind of heat generated and they closed up. To Phillips, this discovery could be evidence of the craft's propulsion disturbing the Earth. But there is an additional scientific anomaly that investigators have yet to explain. The craters were about an inch and a quarter deep in some very hard soil. So I don't know if, it, if this occurred on landing or if it occurred on ascent. But no sound was ever heard at any time indicating any kind of propulsion system. And yet it had to exist for this four-foot object to cross the wind three times. In the course of Phillips's investigations, trace cases like the Cato event consist mostly of physical effects left behind on the ground. But in 1979, a mysterious object not only leaves trace evidence, it nearly kills a Minnesota deputy sheriff. I believe that something extraterrestrial really did happen. Nobody's ever been able to prove that it was something different. Now, investigators look over the actual patrol car and find new evidence. So this actually has flexed in and back out as though there was sort of a suction. Something like that. Pulled it out. Yep. I mean, that's incredible. August 27th, 1979, Warren, Minnesota. It was a routine patrol for Deputy Val Johnson. But at 2.19 a.m., his life would suddenly change. He sees a light off in the distance on an adjacent road, blacktop highway, two-laner and figures that it may be a small aircraft with a landing light coming in to make an emergency landing. So he turns down that road to see if he can render assistance. Almost instantaneously, that light went right from like a mile and a half away to right in his face. And he ended up crashing the car. After the crash, police dispatch receives a call for help. enforcement officers who saw the damage firsthand was Marshall County Sheriff Herb Morstead. Sheriff Morstead, a deputy at the time, vividly recalls the night of the encounter with the actual car from the event. And Al Johnson was still in the car. He was dazed and seemed kind of confused, didn't know for sure what had happened to him. And uh, there was considerable damage to the car that was documented at that time. He was driving a Ford LTD, and you don't damage an LTD with some little trivial thing. There was quite an impact. The physical damage to the car baffles the investigators on the scene. To look down, first damage was done to the headlight of the car. It's busted. It's in the original condition it was from that night. The interesting thing is you can see by looking at the headlight, there's no deer hair or debris or anything in there that would explain how the damage was done. And then as you move up on the car onto the hood, there's a round dim in the hood. And further up on the windshield is busted and cracked quite severely. Again, there's no evidence of any rocks or debris or anything that would have broke this windshield. And further on in the car up on the roof, there is one of the lens from the warning lights is busted. And behind that are the two antennas that were damaged. The interesting part 
on these antennas was right where the antenna bends, there were bugs attached to that antenna, which would indicate that nobody could have physically or used a tool to bend that antenna because they would have had to disturb those bugs. The effects of Deputy Johnson's alleged UFO encounter go beyond the damage to his police cruiser. Later on, the investigation continued. Val Johnson was found to have had what they call welder's burn to his eyes, supposedly from the light that he had encountered. One of the other things that was curious is the watch on his wrist and the car clock both stopped for 14 minutes. That's kind of an interesting piece of evidence. For what most people don't know, though, a lot of cops will synchronize their watches with dispatch, the car clock, and then their private timepiece, so that all three were operating at the same time, so that in the course of your night, you made notations in reference to a case that it would be as accurate as possible. I wish I knew what happened during the 14 minutes that these two time pieces were affected. But there is, again, a, a lot of room for speculation, scientific speculation, of what happens when a person's involved in, in something like this. Deputy Johnson's squad car has been put on display at the Marshall County Historical Society Museum. Phillips has traveled more than 1,000 miles exclusively for this History Channel program in order to see the damage firsthand. Phillips arrives in Warren, Minnesota, and receives a personal guided tour of the squad car by Sheriff Morstead. I've looked at photos of this so many times, it's like I've actually seen it. Mm -hmm. And that's incredible. Phillips is then startled by a new piece of evidence given by the sheriff. The windshield has probably got the most damage. It's uh, damage that was caused by a force pushing that windshield in and then back out again. And really? Yeah. So this actually has flexed in and back out as though there was sort of a suction? Something like that. Pulled it out. Yep. I mean, that's incredible. For more than three hours, Phillips and Sheriff Morstead survey the car and discuss the case. Phillips also learns that current law enforcement officers have no doubt about Johnson's story. Well, I believe Officer Johnson, uh, when he was working as a deputy, uh, I believe he was honest that night. He just he told the facts. Bell Johnson was uh, a good, honest man, a good deputy sheriff. And I have no reason not to believe him. When an officer comes forward with a story of an encounter, he or she risks everything, their career, their personal life, maybe their marriage, their family. They're putting it all on the line. Phillips has now reopened his investigation into the Minnesota encounter in hopes of finding out what really happened in the early morning hours of August 27th, 1979. Many researchers believe that this trace case, along with thousands of others, will eventually lead us to the truth about UFOs. I think trace, landing trace cases, physical trace cases, are a very important aspect of the whole picture, especially when people say there is no evidence. Well, fingerprint is evidence, isn't it? So often you hear people say, well, I don't believe in UFOs, or I'll believe it when I see it. Well, the significance of that is they could just look at a trace evidence case and they can say they've seen it. It gives us evidence that, along with the witness's observation, that there is something out there. I think what we're finding at the landing site certainly confirms the reality of what are called UFOs. And it confirms them because it is proof positive that something very unusual took place. And what remains there is... He 
invaded Greece by creating a bridge of hundreds of boats, becoming the first man to ever span the mighty Bosphorus. Witness one of the great engineering feats of the ancient world on Engineering and Empire, the Persians, next on the History Channel.